Wilmington tonight. Uh, my name is David Bednar. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of CU Mortgage Direct, the wholly owned subsidiary of, C of Sioux Empire Federal Credit Union. Um, I'm not a mortgage loan officer, but I slept at a Holiday Inn Express last night, <laughs> so I'm going to try to do my best um, to, to make this fun because everybody's, everybody's heard about the mortgage crisis. It hasn't been so fun. And uh, we want you to leave here t today uh, with all your questions answered. And uh, we're going to, in the short four hours that we have here, to tell you about all this stuff. Um, we have a lot to. <clears throat> 10:30. We'll get you home. I don't know what clock you work off. I'm not going to be here for four hours. No, we, <laughs> Tony and I, we have about 45, 50 minutes. So, the, so feel free to ask a question. Um, anything having to do with home loans, I'm going to be talking about the long-term home loans that CU Mortgage Direct offers Sioux Empire Federal Credit Union's uh, membership. So real quick here, I know I talked to a couple people earlier, but how many people are first-time home buyers? Two? Okay. I'm not for sure yet, actually. Okay. Think about it. How many people are looking at refinancing? And then how many people are doing like maybe a construction to a perm type of loan? Home improvement, equity <laughs> loans. <laughs> you're in the wrong place. <laughs> Don't own a home at all. Okay, so you, you're looking at getting some information about a new home loan. Okay, good. So we want to, we want uh, the members of Sioux Empire to know that we speak your language. Okay, we're owned by a credit union. Our philosophy is membership. We talk shares and share drafts. We don't talk checking accounts and savings accounts. It's share and share draft. So we know the lingo, we know how to talk to, to members, we know what Sioux Empire expects um, as far as service to, to their members, and, and we, we expect the same out of our people to you as members, okay? Um, okay. So we operate, uh, CU Mortgage Direct operates out of four branches in the state. Uh, the first one was the, <laughs> you're, you're playing it, that's why. You just need to preview it. There you go. And just go to the top. There you go. Uh, Sioux Falls Southwest team, uh, we have our main operations is here in the Southwest branch here up on the second floor of the Sioux Empire main building. Um, our loan officers that conduct business are listed on the left hand side. In Sioux Falls we also have a North branch team which is located at Sioux Empire's North branch which is um, on North uh, West Avenue. Okay. Uh, we also have an office up in Watertown. Uh, Watertown, uh, Sarah Erickson is up in the Watertown office. You'll know that we're part of, this, of, the, of the credit union movement. Our offices are located inside of other credit unions. So the Watertown office is in, inside of a Bonte Federal Credit Union in Watertown. Sarah Erickson's up there. And then in our Madison office is Lori Norby. That's inside of East River Federal Credit Union. I also did put on the slide here, Lori Norby is also a four-time winner of the First Time Home Buyer Program. Um, CU Mortgage Direct has won a, uh, an award as being one of the top five lenders in the state for the first time home buyer program. Uh, every year that they've had that, we've won it. And then uh, Lori Norby has been uh, awarded the top originator in the state uh, four times out of those five. So here's the, the types of loans that we offer. We do conventional home loans, 30 year fixed rates, 20 year fixed rates, 15 year and 10 year fixed rate programs. We participate in the Southwood Housing First Time Home Buyer Program, uh, FHA. We do VA, so those that might be a vet or have eligibility as a veteran. We can do VA loans. We do Rural Development, which is the USDA program uh, outside the state limits of Sioux Falls and Rapid City in Watertown now, I guess. Um, we do purchase transactions, refinances, and then construction and permanent financing. So all those, uh, those are the types of loans that we do at CU Mortgage Direct. Okay. <clears throat> CU and Mortgage Direct, um, we do everything in-house. We have our own in-house staff, so when you meet with somebody from CU and Mortgage Direct, your loan is processed here in Sioux Falls. It's underwritten here in Sioux Falls. 
it's closed out of our office. The money, if you're closing outside of Sioux Falls, the money gets wired out, but it's our own money. So that becomes our own loan at that time. So you don't have to wait for a decision down in California, New York, or Florida. Everything's done right here for you. Okay. Do you keep those loans? We, uh, it's a good question. We're really pushing to get towards that. Our first time home buyer program, we did. Um, recently, Pierre decided that they were going to get away from the six approved servicers, which included us, and they went to one master servicer, which is U.S. Bank now. So starting April 1st, it's going to be U.S. Bank. So the loans that we have on the books with that program, we're going to continue the service. We're getting very close to being able to offer in-house servicing where that, those loans will stay here. The majority of our loans, 65%, 70% of our loans, our conventional loans, those loans are done and serviced by a credit union partner of ours that is a smaller corporation, but they service that that loan for us. That allows you as a member to make your payments here still. So kind of in a way, it's a good, uh, a good selling tool that you can still make your payment here if you'd like to, but you're not going to have the, the issues that you might have with the large servicer. So, uh, we fund all the loans here. Um, we have... If you have to have mortgage insurance on a conventional loan, everybody's heard of PMI. Through a credit union and through CU Mortgage Direct, our mortgage insurance rates are cheaper. So if you're looking at a $200,000 loan and you have mortgage insurance, you go to Wells Fargo and you shop it with us. No matter what kind of deal they can give you, ours is going to be cheaper. So dollar for dollar, that loan, that monthly payment is going to be cheaper here than it would be at a, at a bank. Okay. At which point do you need mortgage insurance? Anything above 80%. Okay, so if you have a, if you're only putting five percent down or you're putting fifteen percent down, you're gonna need mortgage insurance. And the mortgage insurance is on a sliding scale, so it gets cheaper as your loan to value gets gets lower. Okay. Is that for first time home buyers and that conventional mortgage? It's a good question. Uh, right now the first time home buyers they don't allow you to do conventional loans with it, so you have to do either an FHA, VA, or rural development loan, okay? Rural Development Loan has monthly mortgage insurance. FHA has monthly mortgage insurance, and a VA loan does not have it. So if you qualify for the VA loan, that's kind of the best of both worlds, zero down and no monthly mortgage insurance. Are you going to talk a little bit about the VA loan? I can. I, I, don't, I, I didn't have anything specific because I didn't know what the audience was going to do, but when we get done, certainly ask the question. We can certainly talk if you want to openly or afterwards. It's totally up to you. Um, and we do a lot of VA loans, a lot of government loans here. So that's our, the credit union uh, partnership that we have with not only Sioux Empire, but 33 other credit unions in the state. That's our bread and butter is that, that blue collar government type of loan. So. And then CU Mortgage Direct, we offer low uh, fixed closing costs. So you'll find that if you kind of compare, we're not gonna be the lowest in town, most likely we're never, Definitely not going to be the highest in town, but we're always very competitive. And with you being a, a membership, there's a little bit of a benefit. And in most cases, we can give you a discount on any kind of conventional or, or government type of loan. First time home buyer program doesn't have a, they have very limited fees, so there's really nothing to be discounted on those. We, we make it easy for you. Uh, we have online application, much like uh, Sioux Empire has their. 24 me 7 program with their accounts and their website. We also have our website. They have a direct link on their website. You can apply online. Um, I get all the notifications of all the uh, web applications, and my phone gets going at about 9 o'clock at night till about 11 o'clock at night. Then I get in the morning, and then all the loan officers get all their applications. So everybody does a lot of business online. We hardly, we, we don't very rarely do we meet with a member. Our loan officers, uh, most of them all have smartphones. Uh, they can get phones, or they can get their emails on their phones. They're very, uh, very active with being able to get phone calls or replies back, and so they're always at your access. So, if your credit union is closed or see mortgage direct is closed, doesn't mean that you can't talk to somebody about your mortgage loan at nine o'clock at night if you're going to put an offer in the next morning. So, you'll be able to get that. Okay. Applications are run through an automatic uh, system much like the old days where you have to take an application and run down the hall and have an underwriter look at it. We do everything on a computer, so we pretty much hit buttons based on the application information that you've provided. Uh, we can really give you an answer really in about a half an hour's time. So 
that same day, if you're going to put an offer on a house or you need to have an answer on something, we should be able to get that to you. Everybody here is uh, local. Again, we don't have to wait for any kind of decisions outside of the the uh, <coughs> branch offices of CU Mortgage Direct, so everything's done here. I had to laugh because this last slide I had, I had 78 and I went back and it was about three years ago, so we have 108 years worth of experience and that's with the combined experience of all of our staff. I mean, everybody's been around forever it seems like, so very, very experienced and everything. Question about your underwriting, do you guys also perform manual underwriting as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, we have, uh, in the manual underwrite terminology, we have a VA approved underwriters, we have FHA approved DE underwriters, so we can do those manual underwrites. On the Fannie Mae side, the conventional side, we sell the majority of our loans to Fannie Mae. Um, the reps and warrants on, on manual underwrites is so, so tight that we don't want to do a manual underwrite just because if that loan goes bad in the first 10 years, we have to buy it back. Sure. Versus if it goes through an automatic system, it's, it's two years. So. Okay. Um, our goal is to make it as, uh, this experience as easy as possible for you as a member. They help you make the best possible mortgage decision, and they help you as a member with a variety of financial services to better meet your needs. Mortgages are, in, it, are an integral part of Sioux Empire Federal Credit Union, along with Roger, along with Tony, along with DFS for the insurances and stuff. We want to be part of that financial need that you as the member need from Sioux Empire Federal Credit. So, okay. Um, that's my dog and pony show. So I can, uh, I'd love to answer questions. Where does, does the property have to be located in South Dakota or say a five state region or can it be out of state? That's a good question too. Um, unlike the credit union, we don't have any membership. We're not a credit union, so we have no membership requirements. So, uh, as an example, I'll, I'll kind of touch on what you're talking about. But if you had a, a family member that lived in uh, Chicago and they wanted to buy a vacation home in the Black Hills, we could do that loan. And we do that quite often for people on the East Coast and West Coast and things like that. So, with that said, we operate in a, in a um, seven state region, which is Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota. Um, so all those states we've done home loans in. Each state varies from state to state on what's required to do home loans. So we, we potentially could do a loan like in Florida, but we choose not to because we want to make sure that we have the right documentation for it and stuff. So anywhere in those in those states, we enjoy doing home loans. That's funny you should say Florida. <laughs> That's where we're looking. <laughs> My advice would be, I could do a refinance and a cash out and give you cash back and you go, go pay me back for it. How's that? Or Tony can do an equity loan for you. And, and we're doing lots of those where a lot of people have a lot of cash out and buying condos in Florida or Phoenix or something. Like that. So, okay. You want to talk VA loans? Yeah. So what, what uh, qualification? Uh, Got to be a vet. So to to do to have the eligibility and the correct guarantee amount, we need to have your, a copy of your DD two fourteen. Uh, we never ask you for the original on that. Never give away your original DD-214. And then we get a certificate of eligibility, which if you don't have your little green or yellow um, certificate, we can typically go online. And we have about a 98% uh, success rate on getting a certificate of eligibility right online with VA. It's instantaneous. It tells us how much you're eligible for and tells us if you're exempt from the funding fee or not. So then we, we can take it from there. Based on... Uh, income based on there's based no on income uh, just like an FHA loan you can make you, there, there's no uh, ceiling on the income that you can make so VA and FHA are the same the certificate of eligibility you must have had some kind of a service in in, in the uh, service and typically it's for either um, service overseas uh, a lot of the guard guys will get it if they're going over to the Middle East and they come back and they've served for at least six months over there they get certificate they get full eligibility uh, I don't know. I've never been in the military, um, but I, I think if you're in the military for a certain amount of time, you'll build up your eligibility for VA benefits, and that's part of your VA package. So. Well, you said there's no ceiling, but what is, is there a minimum? The minimum incomes? No, no. And and again, we've we've done loans where somebody's just had like, you know, they've been disabled on a VA disability, 
and they're making uh, $1,100 a month and they buy a $40,000 house. We, you know, that kind of situation will work absolutely. So yes. then you don't have to pay a VA funding fee either. Can you use all the votes? The, the <coughs> funding fee is a little bit higher if you use your VA eligibility again, but you can always you can always turn it and burn it. So as long as your other one's been paid on there. What what is the average funding fee? So if you've been in the military, if you're a, a retired Army, Air Force, whatever it is, it's going to be 2.14, okay. And then for subsequent use, it's typically 3.3. .3. So if you've used your VA eligibility before and you bought your house with no down. And then you're, you've sold it. Now you're going to use it again to step up. It's 3.3. .3. So that's a that's an upfront that's upfront upfront you can, money. You can put it right into your loan. So oh, you can yeah. Roll it into so let's just say it's a hundred thousand dollars. You can okay. finance. That was uh, my question. Yeah, thirty-three hundred dollars on top of that. So yeah, you, VA funding fees um, are always. Uh, you can pay cash for them. We've we've had a couple of those, not a lot, but typically you put it back in your loan, and then. Um, with, with the funding fee, that's the guarantee part the VA gets to guarantee your loan. So in case there's a default on it. What's the credit requirements? The credit of FICO? 640. 640? Yeah, as a minimum. It's the same as FHA too, isn't it? 640? Yeah. Um, FHA is actually a little bit less than that. Us as a company, we've taken a, a just a, an interim policy. We can adjust from that, but our minimum is 640. First time home buyers is 620, okay? but. Us as a lender, we've taken the approach that we want to make sure that we give good quality loans to people that deserve it. 640 is our threshold of pain. If it's, you know, today I approved one at 639 just because everything else made sense. So just because it's not 640 doesn't mean you're not going to ever get a loan, but we look at those a lot harder and uh, we've been shying away from that under 640. Do you pull from a specific credit reporting agency or do you pull from all three because they can vary a lot it's a good question mm -hmm. really good question and um okay here's 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 the deal um if you pull your consumer i was just talking to tony about this um she had a borrower in that pulled a credit report with tony and my credit report is like 25 points higher than tony's on the on the mortgage side we have to pull all three so we use transunion equifax and Experience. So we pull all three, we throw out your high and your low, and we take the middle score. That middle score's got to be 640 or higher. But the mortgage reports are typically higher than the consumer ones. So we get a lot of phone calls when somebody called up and said, hey, you know, uh, I'm, I'm right at the border, my credit score was 685, so I don't know if I'll be able to qualify. We pull it, and it's like 725. Well, on that side of things, on the conventional side, that gives you a better interest rate doesn't cost you as much and all that kind of stuff. So we really tell people, hey, come on in, apply and get things going. I mean, let us tell you that, hey, here's the deal. It's gonna cost you this, or here's your rate, or no, we can't do it, or yes, we can, or stuff. And most of the people leave pretty happy, so. And it is, TransUnion, I, I agree with you, TransUnion's like the worst. That's so terrible. <laughs> it seems to me, that's the one that's always the blacked out. Yeah. Well, and not only that, but if you have a problem, um, I'd be really surprised if you talk, if you could call that 800 number that's listed on the credit report to get through to somebody. So it's really tough. The uh, interest rates on the VA loan are they normally less than? Right now, uh, us as a lender, uh, we get better pricing on the government loans just because they are 100% guaranteed. So if we go to the secondary market with those, there's a zero loss on VA and on an FHA loan. So they're in, they're in big demand. Everybody would love to have have that so they give you a better rate so right now that rate is about 3.75 as compared to a conventional rate which is about four it's going to be probably three and seven eighths tomorrow but that rate on the conventional loans just like a stock um, I set the pricing for the company so I can kind of watch it minute by minute just change and bounce up and down and all over the place and so that'll vary where the government rate will stay pretty consistent so roughly what is that at right now the the VA home loan rate? About 3.75. 3.75. Yeah, and we, we have a 15-year VA program right now, 2.875. Okay, so our 15-year conventional rate's 3 and an eighth, 3.125. So you can see the difference on that. So. What's your tenant? Uh, they, do they? I'm not sure. So there's not a lot of buyers on the market that buy in between 30 there's not a lot of them to even buy 15, but we have an investor that we sell those to that has 30, 20, and 15, 
and you might be the first one to ask me if there's a tenure VA out there that no, I can just just any any loan ten. Oh, a ten year loan on a conventional loan's been about two and seven eighths on a conventional loan. So that's a ten year. Yeah, two point eight seven five. Okay. And the market um, was on was doing really well. Then it just shot up, and so the, I hate when the press comes out and says, hey, rates are at all-time low. They're about a week and a half off, because by that time, the rates have gone up again. That was last Tuesday. Now, for five days in a row, we've had really positive rates with the Treasury, and uh, that rate's coming back down again. But they go up a lot faster than they come down. So, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're talking to one of us, and somebody's telling you, hey, you know, the rate's a little bit higher than it was last week. You know, they, they're telling you the truth. They're being honest with you. And uh, we can tell you whatever rate you want to hear, uh, but we don't, we don't like playing that. So when you um, decide that you want to get a mortgage and you fill out the application, do you, get, do you get locked into the rate on that day? Or between then and closing, if the rate fluctuates, how, how does that work? Um, <laughs> That's another good question. Um, first of all, in order to have an actual application, you've got to have six parts, and that's a new federal requirement that went into effect as part of RESPA in 2010. Okay, so having a property and having a property is part of that. Up until that time, you don't have an application. So even though you give us an application, if you don't have a property that you're going to refinance or buy or whatever you're going to do, we we. We really don't have an application. We have your information, but we don't process it as an application. We can verify your appointments and things like that. But so once we sit down with you and you have a property in mind, we we normally tell you and say, okay, you're going to be closing in 30 days. You need to do a 40-day rate lock, and we give you the option of saying, oh, hey, it's a 40-day rate lock. We we could do. I just did a three-day because it closed and it wasn't locked in because people wanted to wait till the very last minute. And then we locked it in and then delivered it. But uh, typically, it's 15 days, 30 days, 45, 60, 75, 90. Okay, so the farther you go out, the more expensive it's going to be because again, we're tying up money for that period of time, so your rates going to be a little higher. So, if you're <coughs> not going to close on your new house until you know like August or something, if you come in, they're probably going to quote you like four and a quarter. So, and what determines your close date? Like, we live in the house that we're going to buy right okay. now. Um, so like, I'd close tomorrow if we could. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things that have to take place, like an appraisal, title work, survey, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, our side of things is pretty easy. It's about 10 days to two weeks is verify your employments, verify your assets, you know, credit, get all that stuff nailed down. And then it's the appraisers that are kind of delayed right now. We're finding out, like in Rapid City, they're about seven or eight weeks out. Aberdeen's about six weeks out. Um, here they're they're going about two and a half to three weeks unless they're in the area then they'll just knock it out right away. But a lot of that's going to depend on stuff that's out of our control. So typically, realtors, if you're going to buy your house that you're living in, if you set it up for a 30-day closing, that's pretty typical. There should be a reason why, unless something really blows up in between, that you can't close within 30 days. So most of the purchase contracts come in 30 to, to 45 days. So you technically can't get pre-approved? Sure, as they get, say. it's called pre-qualified now. So pre we can give you a pre-qualification letter, and then we can tell you that, hey, that based on the information you've given us, you pre-qualify for X amount of money. And then when you find that house, then we just make sure that the taxes match to what we qualified you at. And then we generate a pre-approval letter. So then at that point, it becomes an actual application, and then we send you out an approval letter. Is it true that you can say, one full card point on your APR for your financing that it's usually worth looking at refinancing? Um, is there a general rule of thumb that you can't actually work out? Well, it takes you about 24 to 30 months to get your money back. Okay. Um, what, what we're doing a lot of, and it kind of sounds like the reverse of that, but we have a lot of people that have rates of 5.5%. And then they walk in and they say, you know, we're going to be out of this house in five years. So it's kind of real borderline if they want to take the bottom line rate. But what we're doing is we're giving them a rate that's like maybe four and a quarter, but we're paying all the closing costs for them. So really, if they owe hundred thousand, their new loan's going to be hundred thousand, but it's going to be at a rate that's a lot lower than what they're paying out. It didn't cost them anything. So that's what we're doing a lot more of, so that people don't have to sit there and say, "Okay, I'm going to be in my house for thirty years, and then it's worth it to drop at a point and stuff like that." So it, it all depends, and your loan amount's a big factor because if you have a loan amount that's fifty thousand, uh, you're probably going to want to drop at three points. 
just in order to make it worthwhile because you're going to pay us, you know, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars in fees, and it's going to take you a long time to recuperate that on a small loan. So. Do you guys have an appraiser that works for you guys? I wish we did. I hear that the appraisals kind of go for whatever the bank is needing to hear. I'll disagree with that now because uh, back in the old days, and I say this is probably um, pre-2010, um, we could just order with anybody else. So if I wanted my drinking buddy to go out to an appraiser, I'd just say, hey, do all my appraisals for me. And not that we did that, but I'm just saying, I mean, we had more of an influence. now. As an originator, I can't even be involved with that, with that whole process. So I have to give it to a processor, and that processor has to go on a rotating basis, much like a pinwheel. And she just says, "Okay, the next one in line is Betty Smith." And I may hate Betty Smith because I know that she's always low on all of her appraisals, but I don't have any choice. That's the way the government operates now. So we have to go in order. We we can't dictate who does that appraisal. At the same time, we don't know if that appraisal is going to be done in a week. Or if it's going to be done in three weeks because I don't I can't talk to that appraiser the processor can't but anybody involved with the with the closing of that transaction cannot have any influence on that appraiser I can't sit there and hold a gun to his head and say hey now this is what I need you to bring that and can't, can't do that anymore so so if that and that, a lot of that went on I mean not here but you know that's that's why we're in the issue that we are if that appraiser reports back that the home for instance is worth 200 mm -hmm. they're appraising in that 200 but the house can be bought for like 170 then do you get to skip out on the PMI insurance without putting money that's, another, money that's down? another good question um, unfortunately not uh, because when you buy a house uh, purchases are made off the purchase price or appraisal whichever is less Okay, so your down payment and all the requirements, and Tony helped us out on construction loans. We used to do a lot of that. Um, you know, people do their own work and build up equity, and then we'd say, okay, that was, those times are gone again. So, you know, if you buy for 150 and it comes at 175, you, you put your down payment based on the 150, and you just you walk out of there saying, hey, I, I got $25,000 worth of equity. Right. They come to Tony and get an equity loan. <laughs> so, so, so let's just say the reverse happens. Okay. You you uh, so you, you put an offer in for 150 and the appraisal comes in at 130. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so what what happens as you going to loan the money to the people that want to buy the house? So what so we come there? we come to you and, and it's Mike, right? Larry. Larry. That was my second guess. So we come up to you and we say, Larry. I thought you were quizzing me. No. <laughs> I say, Larry, your appraisal just came in. It came in at twenty thousand dollars low. And you're like, I really like this house, Dave. So now the next move is you go to the seller and you say, or your realtor, and you say, hey, my appraisal came in low, and we have to take it for what's worth. I can't just go down and get another appraisal and hope that's going to come in higher. So you go back to the seller and you say, hey, here's the comparable sales. We got a couple more shots of going back to the appraiser, and we can say, hey, here's what the real. You know, I missed that comp. Yep, I'm going to redo the appraisal. Gives us a new appraisal. It's back at sales price, 150. Or he just says. This one doesn't even fit. I mean, it's you know three miles away from the comparables. It doesn't have a pool and whatever. Then you got to go back to the seller. And the seller's got to make a decision. Say, hey, maybe I sold it overpriced. And so. So you guys won't fund it. Then. No, we're going to fund it, but we're going to say, hey, you got to put twenty-five thousand dollars down. Because we're only going to pay plus, the plus your yeah. down payment because the down payment is based on one point five. So. The reason I ask why on the market right now, that's why I yeah. want it. And, and if you've done your homework, or your realtor's done your homework, we have, we, we, I come across very, a very small portion of our people that are having that problem. Um, I actually had one of my borrowers had that, and it was $1,250 off. It was not great. It was like a year and a half ago. And they went back and told the sellers, and it was an FHA loan. And the seller said, okay, and they just gave it for twelve hundred fifty bucks and it got closed. Um, we just in the Sioux Falls market we just don't have that big that big discrepancy. I mean the realtors are really good, everybody's done their homework. So So when you see that in the uh, real estate listing and it has concessions, that's probably what that dollar amount is. That's would that be the concessions that, that you're probably seeing is is that there was a difference between yeah. the appraisal and, and the asking the asking price? Yeah. And you'll see on appraisals now that 
the, the downside of this, new, the way the appraisals are done now, is if you live in a neighborhood where there's been five foreclosures, um, you're going to really take a hit on your house. It's not the time to sell because the appraisers can use those, those foreclosures, those foreclosures as comparable sales. And what we see a lot of is we see neighborhoods where there's two sold properties and one was a foreclosure, and then the appraiser makes a note and says, "Hey, this is a divorce situation. This is a short sale." It was sold under market. He's just got to tell us the story. He's got to justify why this appraisal's at 150 and why it's not at 125 where this foreclosure sold at. You know, and that all makes sense. But if they're all selling for 120, your house is going to be 120, even though it's really worth 150 in a good economy or something. So, that's a good question. Everything is run through um, what's called the UCDP. It's a portal that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have set up and all the FHA loans and VA loans have to go through. Uh, what they're doing is they're gathering all the appraisers to put the appraisal. Um, when you look at an appraisal, for those that, that have seen one in the past, uh, they don't look anything like they used to. So they all have a comment of A, B, C, D, and that all equivalates to good, bad, poor, needs work, whatever. We upload it into a system. And, uh, the GSCs, the Fannie Mae's and Freddie Macs are all keeping that in their database. So that now, we're at that point now, they started doing this in 2000. And we're coming up now where if your house at one time was a Fannie Mae loan and it's still a Fannie Mae loan, it just tell, comes out and says, hey, we think the price is right. You don't even have to do an appraisal, you just do a drive by on it. And then if it's not, well, you get the bad news, hey, you gotta do five appraisals on it. No, you don't have to do five, but you gotta, <laughs> You gotta you gotta justify that. And they're just they're just building up their database so that when somebody comes in and buys a house for 150 and they come back six months and they're like, hey, my house is worth 250. They're gonna say, eh, eh. here's a red flag. This guy has overinflated his value. Let's just see the appraisal. And then when the appraiser appraisal comes in, it's really reviewed. They gotta make sure that everything's commented on why it's worth 250 when they bought it for 150 six months ago. That whole thing. So. Government agencies are keeping mm -hmm. databases on everybody's property. Is the appraisal fee included in your closing costs? It is. And does every appraiser charge the same amount? Um, for the most part, most of the appraisers charge the same. It's about four hundred fifty dollars, and a lot of them do the radius thing. So the ones out of Sioux Falls, if they got to go down to like uh, let's say Worthing or Bearsford or something like that, they might charge a mileage charge of five hundred, but. The good news for you as a consumer is all the all the regulations changed in 2010 with RESPA. And with that, that basically means that the lenders have to be more honest about things. So when you guys come in and you, you have a property in mind, you want to buy it, you sit in front of a loan officer, that loan officer has to give you a good faith estimate. It doesn't look like it used to back in the day where we can take a pencil and we can say, oh no, I think I, t I told you four points. No, you can't do that anymore. So, we, we have to label it. You got three days to look at it. And if you want to wait the three days, you sign an intent to proceed that it's a part of our packages. That means you're going out with the loan, you're good with everything. But those those fees cannot vary. So if I tell you it's going to be one point and you're borrowing 100000 and it's going to be $1,000, when you go to closing, it's got to be $1,000. So you're talking points now. Yeah. Uh, that was another and, thing and, I was going to ask And the, ask about. the appraisal's part of that bucket where, so, when you come and apply, what the loan officers are doing is they're calling up the appraiser and they're saying, hey, you got my appraisal, what's it going to charge? And the guy says, oh, okay, well, it's down to where thing. it's going to be $512.50. So that's why you see a $512.50 charge, because that's what we're going to get charged. And so everything's got to be pretty much, there are some buckets that can have a tolerance of 10%, and then there's a, there's a bucket, there's three buckets. The bottom bucket can vary because that's your escrow. So if we disclose three months of taxes, it could actually be seven months or whatever. That's, that can vary, but. So points is the same thing as closing costs? Points is the charge for that loan. That's the first bucket, that's the origination bucket. Okay, so that'll be your top bucket. That cannot change unless you come back and say, ah, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna put 30% down, I'm only gonna put 5% down. Well, now it gets more expensive for us to do that loan, so we can pass that new cost on to you. So we'll have to redisclose it to you. We have to do that within three days of closing. Are there any loans that don't have points? Yeah, again, some of the loans that we can pay your closing costs for, you'll just it will just say zero. I mean, you know, there's no cost to you as a consumer. But 
we also disclose to you, and we have to, we have to say, you're paying, you're taking a rate of 4.25, but we're also giving you three thousand dollars in closing costs. So that's disclosed on that good faith estimate. So everything's up front now; nothing's hidden. And you, and you as consumer also, that third page of that good faith estimate has little boxes on it that, you know, if you're if you're at a bank and they're they're kind of telling you you don't feel right, and you come back here. Then we can fill in those boxes for you. We can tell you exactly where our fees are going to be, so you can shop up to three lenders on that same good faith estimate. So, okay. so you have that right now. Gee, this has been good. Are you going to talk uh, construction loans, or are you going to talk construction loans? Tony will talk construction loans um, on that side, and I'll just I'll just jump ahead of that, but. If you're looking to do a construction loan, you're going to start with us to get pre-approved for it, okay? And then we're going to we're going to send you down to Tony. Tony's going to take care of you as far as doing your disbursements, getting your your appraisal going. And um, her and City Mortgage Direct work hand in hand. So between that part, then we come up with the final takeout, and then we'll come back in and do your takeout loan for you. So, okay. Any other questions on the long-term financing? Okay, I'll be your clipper. So, um, I'm Tony Woldry. I'm the mortgage loan officer for the loans within the credit union here. I work for the credit union for just about 11 years now. Uh, I love doing the mortgages here, so anytime you have a question, contact me. The branch managers, <coughs> excuse me, at each branch also do mortgage loans. Uh, mostly they do the home equity loans, the second mortgage. Specifically, these are the products that we offer. We do have also first mortgages within our credit union. Um, they are different than what Dave does upstairs. <coughs> In the manner of they're not, they're just conventional loans. They aren't. We don't have a choice of VA, MHA, and all that. But we can, if something goes amiss with a loan that Dave is trying to do for someone, we have been able to get that member into the house, say their credit score is 635 and he needs 640. We can uh, look at doing that purchase for that member for a year to get their credit score up and then they can refinance again with see mortgage direct. So it is possible to purchase a home and finance it here at the credit union. Um, the other products we have are the construction loan, which is also a first mortgage. We offer land loans and then the home equity, home equity line of credit, which are the second mortgages. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk more about the first three products because we're talking about the home ownership. <coughs> okay, within the credit union, um, what we can mortgage, unlike C Mortgage Direct, we can put a mortgage on property just within the state of South Dakota. We don't have lending authority and I'll know all the rules for other states. <clears throat> the property must be located within the state of South Dakota, normally within a hundred mile radius <coughs> of, of here. Although we do have a mortgage in other states um, farther away. Um, also the property needs to be under 40 acres and zoned properly, which means it can't be agriculture or commercial. It can be rural residential though because we do have acreages out there that goes on. Um, we also can accept second loans as collateral and um, a lot of people and members maybe they want to buy a cabin at the lake. Um, we can accept that as collateral as long as it's in the state of South Dakota and it's not part of a timeshare uh, because then that gets into percentages of how what percent do you actually live there? I'm the only part of that. But, um, and then we can accept land as collateral. Mobile homes, per se, we don't accept as collateral, but we can consider the value of the land it sits on. So if someone, let's say, um, has some equity in their current primary residence, they can actually take cash out from a home equity loan to purchase a cabin too. So there's many different ways that you can go about purchasing the property. <clears throat> Some of the possible closing costs with the credit union, um, we do charge an origination fee just for purchases and construction loans. Uh, 
um, any other form of <coughs> type loan that you would get at the credit union, or if you already own the property, we don't charge the origination or processing fee. Um, we do also um, order appraisals in the same manner as the Mortgage Direct does on a rotating basis, and actually we use their approved appraiser list. So, so if we get an appraisal on a property, or if they do, and the member comes to us and wants a second mortgage after they've done their purchase, we can use a copy of CU Mortgage Direct's appraisal. Um, so that saves the member $450 and getting two of them. How far out will you go with that? Um, within a year. We'll within take year. a look at it and, and see, but normally not over a year because the you know, values can change so rapidly. Oh, Tony, let me just butt in real quick because you're probably thinking, okay, what about if I do like a, a conventional refinance or whatever? If something happens on a conventional site, it's typically 120 days, then we have to get a resort of value, so we have to just make sure that the house still has the same value as before. Tony runs into a lot of times with new construction where they like to have everything wrapped up in about six months on occasions. It might go over six months. In that case, again, we go back in and do what's called a resort of value. The appraiser goes out to the property and says, Hey, you know, it hasn't declined and the value is still there. So that's what we require. Yeah, that's the difference between our types of loans. Um, all our underwriting is done within the credit union here, so um, we have a little bit more flexibility in that area. Uh, title insurance, we get a title insurance commitment on every application for any type of mortgage loan um, in the credit union because we need to, or in the applications because we need to know how the property is deeded, what liens are on it. Um, we do second mortgage and we have done third mortgages but we, we don't like to do, be in third place unless it's behind the second mortgage of our own. There are people who have say a fixed rate second mortgage and now the HELOCs or the line of credits are really looking good. Um, we may let them put one behind that, <coughs> that other one. <coughs> Excuse me. The surveys, um, normally we don't need a survey unless it's uh, for a purchase loan and there's not already a survey on file. Um, but we could ask for a copy of what they got when they purchased the, the house. The doc prep fee, we uh, get our docs on the uh, website, IDS doc, it's only $35, so that's very, very, very expensive. Inspection fees could be another uh, cost, and that's in for construction loans or home improvement loans. When you get a construction loan, we'll go through that a little bit more here. Um, the appraiser who does the initial appraisal is the one that will also be inspecting the property loans to do that anywhere from $75 to $125, depending on what the property is. So we collect about four or five collection fees up front for the construction loan. The home improvement loans, normally the appraisal is ordered subject to, say, their basement being done. Then we have to, when that's done, send the appraiser back to finalize and say, yes, the um, project's been done and this is the value of the house. So there's just one inspection fee on those. Um, we always make sure that um, to see if the uh, property is in a flood zone, if it is, then we have to do something different. So. The flood certification um, fee is only about $14 to get on the website also. Uh, if the mortgage uh, purchase, purchases always close at a title company, um, and that would be for land or a home. Construction loans, depending on uh, if the land is already owned by the member or not, we can close loans here if you own the property. If you don't and it needs to be transferred, then you close at a title company. Recording fees would be to record the mortgages at the register of deeds, and that's just their normal cost. The credit bureau reports are pretty inexpensive at $7 for a joint one. And sometimes we have to wire out for FedEx costs, so that is another possible big cost. Okay. Your origination processing, is that based on the value? What, what's, your, what's your fee there? That's based on the loan amount. Loan amount. Mm -hmm. On the flood certification, is it a 100 or a 500 year projection? It's a 100. And, and some of those have been changing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's on a lake, is it considered floodplain? Not necessarily. Okay. We have a couple um, members that I know of right off hand that 
one of them was at Ponson, and you know that flooded here mm -hmm. not very long ago. But that's not in the floodplain. If they're up higher, they're not. Yeah, no. they go by elevation sometimes too. So. Just has a really small amount of rainfall. It's got nothing to feed yeah. into it. So. If that changes though, and we have the flood survey file, um, LPS National Flood is the name of the company that we get our certifications through. They will fax us notification and report saying. Sometimes we get reports just saying, is this loan still in effect? Is it's a life of loan type certification? If that changes, we do get notified that all of a sudden this property has oh. been stated to be in a flood zone and we have to notify the member and they have to get flood insurance. I'll speak up too because the worst phone call we have to make is we're servicing a loan or we're doing a loan and we're still holding on to it before the sale of that loan. If, if we get notification, any of our loans we require for you to know as a consumer that if that flood um, flood zone changes, we have no choice. You got to get flood insurance on it. You, you, you can't just say, ah, not, you know, I don't think there's absolutely no way because then they can call your loan due. So you will get a phone call and a, and a letter saying that you have 30 days to get flood insurance on there. If you don't, we got to force place it. So ours works a little bit differently, but it's on the same line. Same line is to protect. Ours, ours are all GSE loans, so the government just says, hey, we don't want any kind of suits. I'm just going to put flood insurance on there to protect everybody, and we're not going to worry about it. So. And there have been times when we've been notified and notified our member that that floodplain has changed, and now they are stated to be in one. Um, and that member has actually gone, had to, and, and been successful at it, gone to the county and said, I can't be in a floodplain. Look where I'm at. Well, then it costs them a little money, but they get elevation tests and everything else, and we have them renew their certifications and that. So they, it's a little work, but it doesn't happen much. So <laughs> that's something we have to worry about. Okay, so first we're we'll going to tell you about first mortgage is at um, the credit union. You can, some members have uh, owned their home. And if they come and say, I want to do a home improvement loan, and they don't have a mortgage on it, that's considered a first mortgage because they don't have one. Not, first mortgages aren't just specifically purchase loans. They can be, uh, it's just because there's the first lien on the house. They can use it, uh, can use it for uh, your, the purchase of your primary residence or a second home. So if you have equity in your existing home, you want to buy that late cabin, you can use the equity in it and pay cash for the cap. Um, we can mortgage up to 80% of the purchase price or appraisal, whichever is less. And we do offer amortizations on loans anywhere from five to three years. Our fixed rate mortgages have a five-year balloon. And that basically means that if you have a 30-year first, uh, first mortgage at the credit union, at after you've paid that loan payment for five years, it's time to relook re at the loan. It actually protects you and it protects us from any changes, major changes in interest rates. Um, many of them go down after five years because you've gained equity in the house and your credit scores may have gone up, so then it puts you in a different bracket. So uh, the balloon loan is um, just basically wherever your balance is at that time. If you decide that you want to continue repaying that loan, then you do need to reapply and be approved for that loan to continue another five years. As, uh, we do offer escrows for property taxes, homeowners insurance, and association dues. If you have those, um, we have the ability to escrow that through our system, and we don't charge for a set of that at all. Sometimes escrows are required on a first mortgage, uh, because of all the new regulations, depending on the interest rate um, of the loan, if it's considered a higher price mortgage, then it would be like that loan would pay. Our interest rates on, on fixed rates range from 5.5 to 11, 11 11.5, depending on credit score and loan value. So, um, do, okay, so. That's okay. <laughs> the construction loans that we offer here at the credit union, you can't, you know, that kind of thing. Oh. <laughs> um, we started our first construction loans about the same time CU Mortgage Direct opened. We did our first one on December 31st, 
December 10th of 2003. And last month in March, we opened our 100th construction <coughs> line. Total lines of credit approved, 18744000 which is an average construction loan. <coughs> <back>. <laughs> So, which is an average uh, construction loan line of credit of 187. Uh, that just kind of tells you that we we do them, we know what we're doing. If you need help, have questions on them, just let us know. Um, they're fun. They can be stressful. Uh, they're a lot of paperwork, um, but uh, it makes us feel good that we actually help 100 people either completely gut and remodel a house, move one from one spot to another. Or, or build one. So there's many different purposes and, and, uh, for construction loans. It's not just basically ground up to build it. It can be for reasons too. Stressful to you or stressful? <laughs> <laughs> Probably both yeah. parties. I don't know. Can you explain, Tony, how we lend to the member instead of to the company? Sure, sure. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so when you apply for, if you come to the credit union and talk to me about a construction loan, my first question to you is going to be, have you gotten permanent financing approval? Because our construction loans are just a six month term. We want it paid off in six months and preferably by seeing Marcus Direct. But we want you, um, what you need is the regular mortgage application. There's some disclosures that go with that application. Uh, you will need a licensed contractor to you know, see, oversee your project. Uh, you'll need plans, specs, cost breakdown in order for us to order an appraisal. And that appraiser is going to say, when this is all said and done, this is what it's worth. Um, so we take, you know, in order to set up that line of credit for you to use, then you need the permanent financing approval and you need an appraisal. building a house. If uh, the general contractor actually can't come to us and say, here, they owe me 15000 for part of the work on the house, we're giving the loan to you as a member. So you need to approve all the disbursements that happen during the process. Even though you've got a contract with the contractor, he can't come in and ask me for money. I'm not going to give it to him. I'm going to get with you and say I've got this invoice that one, they want me to pay. Um, and also, I have a disbursement worksheet that I fill out and keep track of what's been dispersed so I look and see if that's already been dispersed. We don't want to pay for something twice. And then I contact you as a member and say, is it okay for me to pay this bill? And so you actually have approval of all that goes out. What if I'm kind of acting as my own general contractor? There's a questionable subject. Um, if you've had prior experience doing that, and you can show us references of places that you've overseen the work of, of teachers, <coughs> we may allow you to do that. Um, we have had not the greatest things happen with people who do their own. However, if you if you have that experience um, behind you, certainly we have let people that are not licensed generally. I think a lot of that also can say, are you just talking about finishing your bathroom basement or are you talking about building a house? So two different distinctions here. If you're talking about finishing a shed in your backyard, we're going to say, have at it, good luck, hope you don't hit your thumb with your nail. But if you're talking about building a 5,000 square foot home and you say, this is the first time I've ever done it, I'm willing to give it a shot. Tony's answer is going to say, you've got no clue what you're doing. We're not going to lend you $200,000 to do this and risk it. You've got to get a general contract for the maintenance. So there's some variances. If you're talking about adding a bedroom and a bathroom in your basement, you say, yeah, I've done this before. Okay, how much do you need? We'll take a look at it and potentially consider it. Okay, again, stick built from the ground. You just give us a bare lot and you say you want to build a house and you've never done it before. We don't want to be a guinea pig with you on that one, to be honest with you. What about, I know it's kind of common to have the contractor <laughs> you know, put in the frames, and all the electrical, the plumbing, everything like that, and then somebody that is going to be the 
owner of it comes in, does all the sheetrock, you know, tape texture, gets everything in that way to finish it off that way. Is that acceptable? You're talking about sweat equity, right? You want to put some of your own finishing touches on it. <coughs> as long as it's finished to the point where it's livable. Okay, in other words, worst case scenario, we're saying if you choose not to finish that home, mm -hmm. what would we have to do with it? And if you if it's not livable, if it doesn't have an occupancy certificate, again, unless you can prove to us that you've done it before and you've got the experience and we've got sufficient money set aside. Odds are we're going to say, no, you need to let the general contractor at least get it to the point where there's an occupancy permit. So if we had to take it back, we could sell it and somebody could walk in. Right. Now, again, if you've got the upstairs finished and you just want to finish the basement later, or you've got the garage built, but you don't have it insulated, you know, those last little things, if you want to put in your yard, you know how to seed or side a yard, some of those kinds of things, we're more than willing to talk to. And then on my side, sweat equity is gone, so we, we can't use that as down payment money or anything. So if you want to, if you want to be nice and have put your contractor and paint your house or something, that's fine. You still have to put your down payment down. So also, if you're doing some own labor of your own, you can't be paid back for that. So. Is is it just the credit union that requires a licensed contractor or? If I were to go to another facility for a uh, construction loan, are they going to require a licensed contractor? I'm pretty sure they do, but I'm, I can't speak for them, I guess. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that because okay. um, we, we're trying to bail out people that are at banks with construction loans that they've called us and said, our bank called us up and said they're calling our construction loan due because their policies have changed and this is our first house on we can help them, you know. So, I, I'm, I don't know, I, we can't say that Sioux Empire is the only one that requires that, but I would say that majority of financial institutions require a general contractor to be involved. There are so many, so many situations where that construction loans just went rampant, and, and the amount of houses, and I'm not saying thousands, but I'm just saying 10 in Sioux Falls is a lot, where the houses weren't done, and they're still at the studs, and the guy just walked away and just said, hey, you know what, I'm moving back to Minneapolis. And the lender gets stuck with that house, and now they gotta deal with it. So that's what that's what happened. That's why you know the financial institutions requiring contractors get involved. There are risky loans for but I have additional questions, but I don't want to take up the whole thing. I can I'll talk after. Okay. These are just this is just a little list of some do's and don'ts for construction loans, um, it's always a good idea to have some money of your own. Um, if you end up short somehow, you've got to have, you've got to have some money to put in of your own. Uh, even though, you know, uh, used to be anyway, South Dakota Housing has a map loans, first time home buyers, and this and that, uh, which require what, maybe 3% now? Okay. Okay. Get zero best thing you can do is buy your lot ahead of time. Have some money of your own. If you have a home that you're living in and you want to build one, sell that first. Make sure that's done because that can be a disaster when you're six months down the road and you've got two houses. What do you do? Um, most importantly, first of all, talk with a mortgage loan officer about a permanent loan and where your comfort level is with the payment in the end. Uh, they're going to let you know what they can approve for you, but are you going to be comfortable with that payment too? And make sure that they'll give you an idea of how much they can finance or, or you, and then you'll know how much maybe you have down to put that together. Always get two to three bids and check for the contractor's credentials. Ask for a list of projects they've completed so you can make an informed decision before signing a final contract. That's a really good idea. You can check. Um, I think it's on the Secretary of State's website, isn't it? That you can check contractors and uh, what their status is with the state. Um, you can see on there, and it's free. Another um, good reference is the Homeless Association of the Sioux Empire. Right. So HOF, they're, they're, they're homeless. Yeah, there's many, many resources out there that uh, have so that you can check on, check on things. Um, one of the things you should not 
we have a cost breakdown sheet that we can give you if you want to play around with it even um, and fill it out this is what this is going to cost lighting set to you know excavation and everything else just see what it'll cost but you can't forget to add in the closing costs for both the construction loan and your permanent loan so that you're going to have enough funds and you'll have the total this is the one cost. time now that i'm going to tell you that if your appraisal comes in higher than what your construction costs are and you own the lot that acts as your down payment so if your you know if your total construction costs come up to be 150 and your appraisal comes in at 200 you don't have to come up with a down payment you're pretty much set to go so it's a good idea to buy that lot first and we can help you <laughs> it, it just changed it just changed in january uh for about two or three years it was that even though you own the lot if you didn't own it for at least 12 months prior to the start of construction you had to put a down payment down they just reverted that back so it loosened up a little bit in january so now depending on whatever the appraised value is that we can use that as your loan value so. that's a good <coughs> and one of the last things that during the construction loan that you don't want to do is incur more debt during the construction that could blow your permanent financing which could just be the best <laughs> because then you don't have permanent financing taking the construction loan now. Um, and you'd be financing with any credit you have at higher rates. If we choose to. Right. And that's not saying we could. So. Um, so just a little bit about the construction loan itself. You need a pre-approval from the permanent financing. The plans, specifications, cost breakdown, material list, and or one bid from the contractor if you don't have all those specific things. Sometimes contractors will make one contract that you agree on and sign together which has all the information in it. But for the most part, it contains the plan, the specifications, cost breakdown, materials that the appraiser needs to do the appraisal. 80% of the appraised value or the cost to build is what we base the line of credit on. Sometimes at the end of the construction loan, maybe you've maxed it out and you still have, say, a couple bills to pay, that's where the permanent financing can pay some of your final bills. But normally it works out pretty good. Uh, the construction loan is a six month term. It can be extended three times for 30 days each, so up to nine months, uh, if needed because of unforeseen circumstances. Maybe it's bad weather. 90 days, right? 90 days, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, something that can be extended. Over the over the nine month term oh, sure. time period, then we would have to go to the board of directors to have it approved month by month or something. Really happened that they couldn't get it done in time. There are payments on a construction loan that you'll pay during construction. We, uh, calculate that on half a percent of what you've drawn, not on the line of credit itself, but say uh, the first, when you open the construction loan, you have your costs in there and you bought your lot, you owe $50,000, you take half a percent of that, that's what you pay that month will be. That basically pays your interest. So just basically interest. Basically paper. interest. It's just an easy way to calculate it, works out good. Um, <coughs> we don't have that whole bunch of accrued interest sitting there at the end to pay that during. We do disbursements on the construction loans twice a month, more or less, around the first and 15th of the month. Um, you can bring in uh, invoices from your contractor, or a, a lot of times they'll just fax them to me, and then of course then I will contact you and get approval for those. Disbursements are all reviewed and approved by us here internally. What else? And, uh, Monthly inspections required, they're done by the appraiser who we order the initial appraisal, appraisal for them. And they have an inspection sheet and they take pictures for us so that we, we are up to date on a monthly basis. Did I miss, did I miss, maybe I did, uh, interest? What, what, what's your going interest the on? interest this? rate? I'm that goes by credit score also. Um, prime plus three quarters, I think four percent is where they start, six and a half. You do have need a credit score of at least so if you got an excellent credit score, should be able to get about four percent, about four percent right on the construction. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's Decent. really, really good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Prime plus a margin. Anybody want to buy a house? <laughs> <laughs> you got to sell yours to build a new one. <laughs> so, yeah. um, 
also, uh, we do land loans, and those are first mortgages too. They're just on bare land. If you decide to buy that piece of land and pay for that before you want to actually build on it, we do have a product for that. Um, we can loan you up to 80% of the purchase price or price value, whichever is less. So you do need a down payment, definitely on land. Um, we just will take one mortgage on those and not a second mortgage. Those for purchasing come or close at a title company because they have to prepare a deed and transfer it. The terms on a lot of land loan are from five to fifteen years with a five-year balloon, so fixed rate loans. And the property must be in South Dakota less than 40 acres and sold property, just like any other property that has Do you do that 40 acres or less because of the Trying to buy land for a development is, is usually it's considered that. agricultural if it's over 40 acres, and we, we can't do we don't take agricultural okay. land or commercial. So it could be farm. like a 40 acres or less could be considered a hobby farm if you want to do something like that. Again, on, on our side of things, I mean, we look at anything that might potentially be income producing, even if you have a hog confinement and you have 300, you know, hogs in there, that's income producing and ag, and we can't do anything. Okay. Um, if you, typically on our side of things, we'd like to see things at 20 or below. And, and the reason for that is very seldom do you find um, a property that has 40 acres and the house value, the house value, that land being 70% or greater of the total value. A lot of times you find like a house that's, that's worth like 50% of the total value because there's so much land value. We don't want to do land values on our side of things, and so we like to keep that at 70%. So 20 acres or less is pretty typical, and then you have to find comparable sales. The appraiser has to find comparable sales that are in that 15 to 25 acre range. That's pretty that's pretty easy to find, but finding a house of 40 acres at 70% of the value of the total land and having three other sales in the general area, that's going to be pretty tough. So that's we why we don't do a lot of loans that are you know up right up. To 40 acres, it's usually 20 or less than you buy the house on or whatever. So, uh, I've got the home equity thing up here just for quick to let you know that if you do have equity in the home that you live in, um, we have home equity loans available which you can use to purchase a lot of yourself, <coughs> um, should you have that much equity in it. So, there's you know, creative financing for different things that you want to do, there's all, always something else to look at. We do have products available up to 100% of appraised value, and it says tax assessed value on there. Um, also, so each application is looked at individually. If you're <coughs> applying for a loan to use 100% of your home equity, um, we look at those pretty cautiously. Um, we don't want you to have all the equity in your home uh, used up. So, but the product is available. And then the line of credit right now is a hot product because it's based on prime rate, which is three and a quarter. So you can um, get a home equity line of credit as low as 2.75 and as high as, I can't remember that number, seven and a quarter, depending on where your loan to value and your credit score is. This has been a great product for people to use right now because of the low interest rate um, and also, you know, uh, it's, flexible. You can take draws on it, pay it back, you have a five-year draw period on it. At the end of five years, similar to the fixed rate loans which have the balloon, at the end of the five years then we ask you, do you want to continue paying and using this line of credit? Do you want to, do you want us to take out the line of credit and you just continue paying with no, no access to that? So there's you know, time to review that in five years again. We don't charge a yearly cost for our home equity lines of credit. So if you pay it to zero, it can sit there and it doesn't cost you anything until you use it again and then all you pay is interest. Is the interest on that, is it, it, going with your last statement here, is the interest off of that, can it, is it just like a mortgage loan? Can you take it off your uh, tax perfect uh, income tax? I believe it, it, it depends on what you use the funds for. We file a mortgage on your property, so it is a legal mortgage against your house. Okay. The question, like Tony is saying, is depends on what you use the proceeds for that. Because one of the questions on your tax return says, 
Is all the interest in this used to improve or purchase your home? And the answer is yes. That's your answer that gives you the ability to say whatever you need to say. So what Tony's saying about paying off. <laughs> That's what I was wondering. I wanted, okay. Paying off credit cards, you know, whatever, vacations, da 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 da. Those are things where we say please talk to your tax advisor to make sure you answer the question properly. <laughs> And that's, you know, pretty much in a nutshell, we're going over a little bit, but if you have questions on any of our products, um, Dave and I are <coughs> usually all the time, so we take a little break, but... There's very few. Um, my name is Jeff Jorgens, and I'm the president of the credit union and the CEO of CU Mortgage Direct. There's very few things that you need a mortgage loan that we don't have the ability to offer. And some of those you've already pointed out. Agricultural loans we don't do. Business loans we do not do. If you want to buy an apartment complex and you're looking at financing a 30-plex, I'm sorry, that's a business loan we don't do that. We're talking about what you need as individual persons to buy some place to live or to build or to finish or to improve. We've got that product. Okay, there's just about no product that you would need that we don't have the ability to offer you if you're looking at something around here. It really is a wonderful array opportunities for you to purchase, to refinance, to improve upon, or to leverage with a home equity line of credit. But if you think of something, let us know, because we don't pretend to understand the entire market. If you come up with something creative, who knows? We could all be winners across the whole country and come up with a new mortgage product. Don't be bashful. Bring something new and exciting. Why not? <laughs>